The Law of Self-Defense content you are about to enjoy is presented for general educational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice. If you are in need of legal advice, consult competent legal counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. Okay, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's episode of the Law of Self-Defense News and Q&A Show. For anybody who might not know, I am attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you very much. We always get a lot of uh, new people, new to the Law of Self-Defense community on our weekly News and Q&A Show. This is the only content we produce each week that's open access, folks. Most of our content at Law of Self-Defense is restricted to our Law of Self-Defense members. I'll talk about that more later. But our weekly Thursday live news Q&A show is open access. So welcome to all of you who are new to Law of Self-Defense. We do air their show every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we broadcast it live on Facebook, on YouTube, and for the Law of Self-Defense members on their member dashboard over at the Law of Self-Defense website. Uh, so I encourage you to bookmark your calendar. Um, so you don't have to miss an episode of this every Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, the Law of Self-Defense News and Q&A show. Uh, if you'd like to submit questions to us ahead of time, if you're a Law of Self-Defense member, we urge you to use your dashboard for that because you'll be prioritized. Everybody else can send questions in for our consideration to show at Law of Self-Defense. And what we do in the show is uh, we cover some interesting uh, use of force law news that's been in the media, have been brought to my attention, seems to be of particular interest to the self-defense community, and as well as answer questions that have been sent in to us beforehand or that are asked live during the show. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, submit questions live during the show just using the uh, comments field on whatever platform you're joining us on, the Law Self-Defense member dashboard or Facebook or YouTube. Excuse me. <clears throat> for those who are really new to law of self-defense, of course, as the name implies, we are a law practice that focuses on nothing but use of force law, meaning defense of yourself, defense of others, defense of property. That's all we do. We don't have a generalized legal practice. We do only use of force law. So that's what you can expect to receive from us in all of our content. All right. So I think we've had time for people to start joining Again, folks, if you could hit that share arrow, if you're on Facebook, hit that like button and thumbs up, um, thumbs up button. Uh, that would be appreciated. Um, comment with your city and state if you're watching live. All of that helps us grow the law of self-defense community. Obviously, Facebook or YouTube or any other social media is not inclined to do that themselves on our behalf. So we need to be a little tricky to encourage them to help promote us. Before I jump into the substance of the show, uh, I would like, of course, to mention our sponsor, which is CCW Safe, a provider of legal service memberships, what many people mistakenly call self-defense insurance. Um, in effect, CCW Safe promises to pay its members legal expenses if the member is involved in a use of force event. And those legal expenses start big and get bigger fast, folks. Most of the cases I personally consult on are aggravated assault cases with a firearm. They involve no shots fired, nobody injured, and that defender is looking at a felony charge of aggravated assault with a firearm, perhaps 10 to 20 years in prison. Typically, a normal law-abiding person who's never been in trouble with the law a day in their lives. And now, just to retain an attorney, they're spending between thirty to $50,000 for a case like that. And that's what they spend if they get the charges dismissed. If they actually have to go to trial, it'll be a multiple of that. So given the financial resources necessary for these kinds of fights, it can be helpful to have a partner behind you to pay those expenses if you're involved in a use of force event. And that's what CCW Safe does. Now, there are a number of companies out there that offer similar kinds of services. Uh, I've looked at all of them, as you might imagine. I found that CCW Safe is the best fit for me personally. I'm a member. My wife, Emily, is a member. Whether they're the best fit for you is something only you can decide, but I do encourage you to take a look at what they have to offer. And you can do that by pointing your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe. And if you do decide to become a member, like me, you can save 10% off your membership at that URL, lawofselfdefense.com slash ccwsafe, by using the discount code LOSD10. That's LOSD for Law of Self-Defense. And the number 10 for... Those of our members who are listening to this in the members-only Law of Self-Defense podcast format. 
So that's our sponsor. Now, obviously, the big story in the news these days is the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Uh, Those of you who are law self-defense members have been getting a relatively constant stream of content legal analysis uh, of that case from us within 24 hours of that event occurring. In fact, we had our first legal analysis up, uh, the in-depth legal analysis of this case. Folks, this one uh, piece of member content, a blog post, a video, a podcast, was by itself an hour and a half. Really, it's almost a mini course in use of force law all by itself, exclusive, of course, to law of self-defense members. And as you might expect, it concludes to a reasonable degree of legal certainty that Kyle Rittenhouse's use of force, both in the parking lot and in the street afterwards, uh, easily qualifies as lawful self-defense. But that's not the only piece we did on Kyle Rittenhouse. Uh, Very soon thereafter, we had our next blog post for our members, Uh, detailing what exactly prosecutors will have to disprove in order to convict Kyle of the criminal charges brought against him. We also explored why so many of the criminal charges brought against Kyle are based on recklessness rather than an intentional use of force. Some of that may be surprising to you. Uh, And once we discovered, of course, that the three primary uh, people against whom Kyle used force had, uh, to say the least, sketchy backgrounds, including uh, reported gun law violations, reported domestic abuse violations. In one case, reports of multiple counts of child molestation. We explored in another blog post to what degree it was likely or unlikely that the defense would be able to get this character evidence about these attackers of Kyle uh, in front of the jury in the courtroom. Then we also did a point, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, people alleging that it was unlawful for Kyle to possess his rifle in Wisconsin because he was under 18 years of age. In fact, that's one of the criminal charges that's been brought against him. A misdemeanor charge, by the way. Uh, So we do a detailed analysis. One of whether it's likely that, in fact, he is guilty of unlawful gun possession. And in fact, a close reading of the Wisconsin statute suggests he's not I know a lot of people are shocked to hear that. Uh, Others are claiming that, while if he gets off, it's just a technicality. But, folks, it's just how the law is written. Uh, The law under which he's been charged, in effect, only applies in the context of the facts of this case to something that would qualify as a short-barreled rifle. And as you can see in the picture there, it's not a short-barreled rifle. So he simply doesn't fall within the scope of that statute. It doesn't matter what people might wish the statute said or what the legislature might have thought they wanted it to say. It only matters what the statute actually says, folks. And what it says is it applies only in the context of this case to short-barreled rifles. That's not a short-barreled rifle. does not apply. Uh, But we cover not just that in this blog post, but also even if it were unlawful for Kyle to be in possession of that uh, rifle, it doesn't matter uh, because even unlawful possession of the rifle would be irrelevant under Wisconsin law in terms of his claim as self-defense. Uh, Being in unlawful possession of a rifle does not cost you self-defense under the laws of Wisconsin. And we go into a detailed explanation, law and evidence-based explanation of that. But it's still not all. Uh, Then more recently, just a couple days ago, we did our most current post on the Rittenhouse case. A lot of people have been arguing that, well, maybe the guy shot in the arm, Gage Grosskreutz, what if he was just trying to make a citizen's arrest? What if he thought the earlier shooting of reported child molester Rosenbaum in the parking lot was an unlawful killing by Kyle Rittenhouse, and therefore he was going to make a citizen's arrest of Kyle? That would make Gage's conduct, if that, any of that were true, that would make it lawful conduct, not unlawful conduct. So would that undermine Kyle's privilege to use deadly defensive force when Grosskreutz approached with the pistol, so we cover that as well. I may do a separate blog post on Wisconsin citizen's arrest law. Uh, Wisconsin, in fact, has no statutory citizen's arrest law at all, uh, but it does have, of course, common law-based, case law-based privileges for citizen's arrest, which, frankly, I don't think would apply in this circumstance anyway, um, but that would be a topic for a future post. All these posts, of course, um, actually arise or are available only to Law of Self-Defense members. So if you're not a Law of Self-Defense member, you haven't seen any of those, too bad, because Law of Self-Defense membership is dirt cheap, folks. It's only about 33 cents a day. That's it. That's the normal price. Uh, And you can try it out for two weeks. A full two weeks or only 99 cents. 
Just point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash trial. You can sign up for a 99-cent two-week trial. If you don't like it in the two weeks, cancel. We'll refund 200% of your 99 cents. So it's a negative risk proposition. But if you like what you see, and most people do, and you decide to stay a member, and most people do, it's still only about 33 cents a day, folks. Nine ninety-five a month. $9.95 a month for hours and hours and hours of world-class plain English evidence-based, law-based legal analysis of these high-profile use of force events. In fact, um, we've been getting so many questions from the general public about the Rittenhouse case, uh, and it's clear, it's obvious, it's to be expected really, that these people, they're new to the law of self-defense community. They've not yet been exposed to actual self-defense law. It's simply rarely taught anywhere at a very high level, except I humbly suggest, here at Law of Self-Defense. So they haven't seen our content before. They haven't taken our courses before. So to help out that general public, the those who are naive to actual self-defense law, we've put together a Rittenhouse-inspired uh, sales bundle for this week. We call it the Rittenhouse Bundle. Uh, to be clear, uh, Kyle doesn't have anything to do with this offering. It was inspired by him. Uh, as always, his legal team is free to reach out to us for any advice or expert opinion we could offer. I mean, frankly, they could become a trial member for 99 cents and pr read pretty much all our legal analysis for that sum of money. So we don't need them to pay us anything really. Uh, but uh, for those of you who'd like a world-class law school level, but plain English education in the law that governs all these issues in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, you might consider our Rittenhouse bundle. It includes our Law Self-Defense Advanced course, which is about eight hours, full day, in-depth instruction on use of force law. It includes our Advanced State-Specific Supplement for the state of your choice. That's state-specific use of force law. It's a separate course. It includes our Defense of Property course, and it includes our newest course on lawful defense against rioters, looters, and arsonists. These four separate courses, if you bought them separately, would be about 500 bucks, folks. This week, $199, so you save about $300. If that's of interest, you can point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash bundle to take advantage of that. But this offer extends only through this Sunday, folks, September 13th. Uh, Sunday at midnight, it goes away. So if it's all of interest, I encourage you to take advantage of that now. Uh, a separate matter. Let's dive into the substance now. The news events I wanted to talk about. One of these involves uh, USCCA. Now, I told all of you up front that one of the USCCA's, USCCA's competitors is CCW Safe. They're a sponsor of uh, much of our content, at least our live content, these Thursday shows. Um, I'm personally a member of CCW Safe, so that's all in full disclosure. Uh, but USCCA has been in the news recently. Uh, around uh, one issue has been um, uh, that they have a member who was involved in a use of force event. She shot her estranged husband in a parking lot while they were supposed to be doing a child swap. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up. Her name is Kayla Giles. She was a USCCA Platinum member. Shot her husband in a parking lot, her estranged husband, um, and uh, was charged with uh, the, uh, his unlawful killing, charged with murder. Uh, she's going to trial. She uh, submitted, uh, her lawyer submitted for reimbursement of her legal expenses to USCCA. USCCA paid the first $50,000 of legal expenses and then cut her off. Uh, now, we can really only speculate as to the reasons they may have cut her off. Uh, in full disclosure, the case looks kind of sketchy. She'd signed up for USCCA only 12 days before she ended up shooting her husband. You know, that could mean she was planning it and wanted the policy in in place before she committed a murder of her husband, or it could mean she was afraid of her husband, was concerned she might have to defend herself, and therefore wanted the policy in place. That would be a perfectly legitimate reason. We don't really know why USCCA has cut off uh, coverage of Kayla Giles, because they won't tell us. Um, I mean, I've had a relationship with USCCA. Uh, they licensed a copy of my book, The Law of Self-Defense, to uh, print for their members. I used to be on their legal advisory board. And I called them and asked them, well, what's the reason you're not covering this person? And they said, well, no comment. We're in litigation because they are in litigation. Uh, Kayla Giles, their member, has sued them in federal court for the rest of the coverage for her legal expenses. By the way, her legal expenses pre-trial are already up over $150,000, folks. So that's how expensive these cases get. 
Uh, I mentioned this case only because it's in the news again, because I believe yesterday was the two-year anniversary of Kayla Giles shooting her husband. So USCCA is popping up in the news in uh, association with those news stories, and people are asking me about it. I don't really have much to say. There's no new news. Uh, I don't know if it's whether because the, the federal suit against USCCA is being slowed down for strategic legal reasons, or it's just COVID slowing everything down. Not much is happening in the case. Uh, I can tell you USCCA has filed a lot of motions uh, for sealing the records in this case. Um, and there is a gag order in effect. So it's hard to get any news out anyway. Certainly it doesn't appear like USCCC, USCCA is at all interested in any kind of transparency in this case, which, as I've said before, leads me to the only uh, position I can be in. And that is perhaps USCCA has a very good explanation for why they're not covering her legal expenses. Uh, but until they provide it, as near as I can tell, they're not covering her because they don't feel like it. Uh, they've personally decided that they don't think it's a case they want to cover, which I don't think is in their membership agreement. And I don't think it's what their members expect, that if they're involved in a use of force event, USCCA is first going to make its own assessment of whether they think they should cover it and then decide whether or not to cover that particular member. I think the, the members expect, hey, if they're criminally charged in the use of force event, they're going to be covered, and the courts will decide whether or not their use of force was lawful or not, not USCCA. But in any case, here, let me pull that up here. Uh, for those who would like to learn more detail on this, I did do a blog post on it some time ago. You can find that at lawselfdefense.com slash USCCA. And this is just the, uh, the featured image from that blog post. But I really don't have much new to say about it other than what I've already told you here and already written in that blog post. Uh, I did want to come back to something about uh, the Rittenhouse case, however. Let me pull that back, pull this back up. And that is, uh, of course, there's a lot of news reporting about the case. Most of it's bad news reporting. Uh, things like, well, if he had the rifle, uh, that was unlawful, and therefore he can't claim self-defense. That's all completely wrong. Uh, both wrong that it's likely the possession was unlawful and uh, wrong that even if it was unlawful, that it would affect his claim to self-defense. That's not true. But there are some issues that are being raised by the media um, that could affect his claim of self-defense. And one of those issues is potentially, well, excuse me, like, let me clear this, clear up my screen a little bit so all of you can see me as I jabber away. Is this better? That's better. So one of the issues that could uh, really impact Kyle Rittenhouse's um, claim of self-defense is this issue of provocation. Now, unfortunately, Wisconsin uses the term provocation to mean two different things simultaneously, which only creates confusion. Um, what the Wisconsin law is referring to is actually two different things, whether or not Kyle was the initial aggressor in the fight, in which case you would lose self-defense because you've lost the element of innocence, or whether he was a provoker with intent in the fight. Uh, those are two different things. So the, in which case, of course, he would also lose innocence. Uh, someone who's the initial aggressor is the first person to use or threaten force. And I guess it's theoretically possible that Kyle was that person. We don't see that in the videos, but maybe evidence to that point would arise. But here's the thing. Uh, an initial aggressor under Wisconsin law in most states uh, even if they were the initial aggressor, have lost the element of innocence, they can regain the element of innocence by withdrawing from the fight and communicating their desire, either explicitly or constructively, uh, to not fight anymore. And a classic way to do both of these simultaneously is to be in full flight from the confrontation. If you're running away from the fight, clearly you're withdrawing and you're constructively communicating your desire not to fight anymore. Now for the fight to continue to happen, that other person has to pursue you. They become the aggressor in a second fight. And in that second fight, you've regained your innocence for purposes of claiming self-defense. Now, anyone who would argue that Kyle was the initial aggressor would then have to overcome uh, the argument of the defense that, well, even if he was the initial aggressor, in both the parking lot fight and the street fight confrontation, uh, Kyle was in full flight in both of those events. So being in full flight, even if he had previously been the initial aggressor, he's regained his innocence, and now the people pursuing him are the initial aggressors in a new fight. So whether or not Kyle might have been the initial aggressor, I think is irrelevant to his claim of self-defense, because even if it were true, he's regained innocence by fleeing from those confrontations. The 
other form of provocation under Wisconsin law is something quite different. It's the being the provoker with intent. Now, the initial aggressor is the first person to threaten or use force. The provoker with intent is not that person. The provoker with intent is someone who provokes the other guy to be the initial aggressor, to provokes the other guy to be the first to threaten or use force so that they'll have an excuse to use force against that other person. It's like, go ahead, punch me, punch me, I dare you. Throw the first punch. Well, the person saying that's not saying it because they want to get punched in the face. They're saying it because they hope witnesses will see you throw the first punch and then they'll have an excuse to use force against you. Well, under Wisconsin law, if you're the initial aggressor, you can regain innocence by withdrawal and communication, as I just talked about. But if you're a provoker with intent, you cannot regain innocence. You own that fight. So if there's evidence that Kyle was previous... Uh, a provoker with intent, well, that could completely blow up his claim of self-defense. Now, there's no evidence of that that I've seen. There's no evidence of that uh, in any of the video that I've seen for sure. So how would evidence of that arise? And this really comes to an issue that was I saw brought up in a, a podcast involving another lawyer, a lawyer called Scott Barnes. Um, he's pretty um, a reasonable high profile on Twitter at He's at Barnes underscore law, at Barnes underscore law, if you want to look him up. Strikes me as a smart guy. I don't know him personally. Uh, I only know him from his Twitter commentary and, uh, and this one interview I saw of him on a podcast. And he raises a lot of really good, interesting points. Now, the podcast is called the Viva Law Podcast, V-I-V-A. I'm not really familiar with it, uh, but I will have a link to the podcast in the text version of today's show at the Law of Self-Defense website if you'd like to check it out. And I do encourage you to check it out because uh, attorney uh, Barnes raises a number of interesting issues. Um, and one is that one of the things we have to be concerned about with this Rittenhouse case is not just the legal merits per se, but that there might be efforts to fabricate a narrative, fabricate an, uh, a evidence against uh, Rittenhouse. How might that happen? Well, Remember, most of the people at this event were not uh, Rittenhouse friends. They were Antifa people. And what if a bunch of Antifa people learn that, hey, if they claim that Rittenhouse was a provoker with intent, Rittenhouse loses self-defense, period. You think a bunch of them, you think people who are willing to set things on fire, attack police officers, attempt to murder someone like Rittenhouse, you think people like that would be unwilling to make up false claims like that? Um, I wouldn't be so confident. I, I can tell you in the Zimmerman case, this would be the George Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin case, uh, at the trial, there were a couple of witnesses the state presented early on. They were clearly supposed to be key witnesses. And they testified about conduct that Zimmerman purportedly engaged in that didn't look very consistent with self-defense. For example, one of them said, oh, well, Zimmerman chased Trayvon Martin. Well, that would be bad. That would be really inconsistent with self-defense. But here's the problem for that witness, or was the problem in that case, uh, the defense had previously deposed her. The state had previously deposed her. She'd been questioned about what she knew about the case before, months before. You have to remember, there was months, like a, a year or more, between the event and the trial. So lots of time for investigation, depositions, collecting of evidence. And the first time this woman ever said that she had a perception that Zimmerman had chased Trayvon was in that witness stand in the courtroom. Well, if you've been questioned again and again and again by both sides in a criminal prosecution and you never mentioned a fact as key as that, well, it's simply not credible that you're mentioning it for the first time at trial, which, of course, is what the defense said on cross-examination. And they just crushed this witness. She looked completely not credible. Everything about her demeanor was a person who was lying on the witness stand. And obviously, the jury gave her no credence at all, given that they unanimously uh, acquitted Zimmerman of all charges. But the reason the defense was able to do that was because they had those earlier depositions. They had that earlier um, questioning where this woman had never said anything of the time and the thing was really of key importance uh, in the narrative of guilt. What happens if you don't have those depositions, that prior questioning? What happens if you really never, for all practical purposes, talk to the witness before they're on the witness stand? Uh, then you have no way to challenge the credibility of their claims. Um, well, in the Rittenhouse case, we could end up with a situation where we end up with a bunch of state witnesses lying on the stand about Rittenhouse being a provoker with intent, uh, providing the jury with evidence that they should deny Rittenhouse self-defense, period, and no way to challenge the credibility or veracity of those witnesses unless they were deposed and questioned beforehand. And 
for that to happen, the defense needs a lot of resources. And from what I hear, they've collected lots of resources already, hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is good. But they also, the defense team needs to be closely engaged on the ground every step of the way. Now, one of the things this attorney Barnes mentioned in this podcast was that at uh, Rittenhouse's arraignment in Wisconsin, um, when bail's now been set for $2 million, which is not really a surprising amount given the circumstances, but at his arraignment, apparently he had no legal representation, Rittenhouse didn't, except for a public defender. Well, if he's supposed to have this dream team legal defense funded with hundreds of thousands of dollars, why wasn't one of them there at his arraignment? I mean, what's, what's going on? Now, I'm assuming, of course, that Attorney Barnes is describing this accurately. I don't know from personal knowledge, but if it's true that the only person at Rittenhouse's arraignment was a public defender, well, I don't know what this legal team's supposed to be doing. And by the way, folks, just because you have a legal team doesn't mean they're going to do a good job. Uh, most of you will be familiar with the uh, Michael Drake case. Uh, this was the, the guy who was uh, knocked down in the parking lot, uh, pulled out his gun while he was on the ground, fired a shot uh, when it looked like the person who shoved him may have taken a step backwards. Um, this is the handicap parking spot violation case. Um, and Drake was convicted, sentenced to prison effectively for the rest of his life. And the key issue in that case was the Tuller drill because Drake was being threatened, if at all, with um, uh, impact weapons, his aggressor's fists and feet. Um, and the question was, of course, whether or not Drake was in imminent danger of being attacked by those fists and feet. And the Tuller drill is key to understanding the reasonableness of that perception, that use of force legal analysis. And in that case, the prosecution brought up a use of force expert witness who testified in the witness stand that the Tula drill only applies to confrontations involving edged weapons. And this aggressor didn't have an edged weapon, and therefore the Tula drill was irrelevant to Drake's claim of self-defense. Well, that's just not true. And anyone who's read Dennis Tuller's writings, he explicitly covers not just edge weapons, but any kind of impact weapon. Um, because his, his, the point he's trying to make is not necessarily what degree of harm the aggressor could cause, but whether or not the aggressor is in a position to be an imminent threat. How quickly can he bring that harm, whatever degree it might be, to bear against his victim? Well, the the defense also brought up a use of force expert, and I thought for sure, haha, this is it. They're going to really gut that state use of force expert who completely mischaracterized the Tuller drill. And the defense use of force expert was some guy that one of the defense lawyers had used to install a security system at her home, like two weeks before. And this guy knew nothing. I mean, he was a very nice guy, but he was completely incompetent in being a use of force expert. And the defense had no idea what the right questions were to ask him. So his appearance was completely pointless. The jury went into the deliberations believing the only thing they heard was that believing that the Tuller drill only applied to edged weapons, and that just destroyed Drake's defense. Now, I'm not saying Drake shouldn't have been convicted. It was a very marginal self-defense case at best. Um, so it doesn't bother me per se that he was convicted. Um, what bothers me is he got convicted without having a, a capable, competent legal defense, in my professional opinion. And we all have a constitutional right to effective defense counsel. And in my opinion, he didn't get it. So if you don't get it, your chances of getting convicted, uh, even in the case where you shouldn't get convicted, they go up sharply, folks. So I certainly hope that Rittenhouse doesn't find himself in the same position where uh, he may have raised a lot of money. He may have some kind of legal defense dream team. But man, unless they get engaged, it's just not going to be of much help. So another issue that come up, again, there's news reporting on this case everywhere. A lot of it is just horrible, especially the stuff where they say that they're reporting what lawyers told them. Uh, here's a news story uh, in which they quote a, an attorney, Milwaukee defense attorney, uh, who uh, claims to have expertise in self-defense. And he told the newspaper that uh, it could be tough for Rittenhouse to uh, argue self-defense because neither of the men he killed meaning Rosenbaum in the parking lot, or Huber, the skateboard guy in the street. Neither one of them uh, is said to have carried a gun or other clearly lethal weapon. Um, well, that's not, <laughs> that's not the, the legally relevant point to this at all. Uh, Rittenhouse is privileged to use deadly defensive force, uh, not if his attackers had a gun or a knife or other 
quote-unquote clearly lethal weapon, he's allowed to use deadly defensive force if either of those men reasonably appeared to be an eminent deadly force threat. Now, in the case of Rosenbaum, Rosenbaum was chasing or pursuing um, Rittenhouse across, uh, across the parking lot, and Rittenhouse was hearing shots fired from Rosenbaum's direction. And we know from the video there was, in fact, someone in that direction firing what appears to be a pistol. Um, so it's easy to imagine that Rittenhouse had a reasonable perception, doesn't have to be accurate or correct, a reasonable perception that the man chasing him from the direction of which gunshots were coming represented an imminent deadly force threat. And with respect to the skateboard guy, folks, the law doesn't really care about the particular means of inflicting deadly force, at least not until sentencing. Uh, all the law cares about is, was it deadly force? Now, clearly a weapon designed for that purpose, uh, used in the intended manner, a gun or a knife used in an offensive way would qualify as a use of deadly force. But folks, a skateboard to the head is deadly force. It's force likely to inflict death or serious bodily injury. That's the definition of deadly force. It's no less deadly force than a baseball bat to the head or a cinder block to the head or a piano to the head. It's all deadly force. And that's what's required. The appearance, the reasonable appearance of an eminent deadly force attack and uh, a, a, a person who's been sent to the ground in a mob attack who's now being struck in the head with a skateboard that's a reasonable perception of a deadly force attack every day and twice on Sunday. So I just point this out again, one, to kind of explain how that law works. And second, just because you see a newspaper quoting someone who's purportedly an attorney with expertise in self-defense law doesn't mean that attorney actually knows what he's talking about at all or alternatively, more kindly, perhaps the attorney does and the media is simply re misreporting what he told them. That's always possible too. But in any case... If it's in the media, you're reading it in the news, you must assume whatever use of force law they're describing from whatever source to be 100% wrong until proven otherwise. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Oh, yes, I was sent a uh, press release from a law firm, happens to be in Texas. Uh, interesting uh, law firm, it looks like. Their motto is, uh, well, the law firm's Walker and Taylor. Right away, it sounds like... Um, uh, a TV show, right? Like a Texas Rangers TV show, Texas Ranger, uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. Walker and Taylor is the firm. And their their uh, motto, their logo says locked and lawyered, which is encouraging from my perspective. Um, but in any case, they, they had a press relief, release um, where they were talking about the risk that Texas defendants, their clients, could find themselves facing charges just like the McCloskeys in Missouri are facing. The McCloskeys are the husband and wife who are out on their front yard, yard uh, facing off a mob of Antifa, people who trespassed on their property, broke the gate to get into their property, um, were apparently threatening them with death, threatening to kill them and go sleep in their bedroom, threatening to kill their pets. Um, obviously a massive disparity of numbers as well. Uh, just the two McCloskeys in front of their home on their front yard facing dozens and dozens and dozens of a mob that the McCloskeys were well aware uh, mobs of this type had been committing arson, burning down buildings within blocks of their home. Uh, so they had a, a reasonable basis on which to have a fear of deadly force harm. Of course, arson is deadly force harm. But they never fired a shot, right? They never shot anybody. They never discharged their weapon. And this Texas law firm, Walker and Taylor, is saying, hey, if they never shot, fired a shot, if all they did was threaten the use of force and they didn't actually use force, those two circumstances should be treated differently. Use of force, mere use of, uh, sorry, mere threat of force should be treated differently than use of force. Uh, now, so there are states that do make explicit kind of public policy decisions about this. Mostly, well, sometimes the courts do it, and sometimes the legislature does it. So there are states that explicitly say, hey, we're going to treat a threat with a gun exactly the same as we're going to treat a use of a gun. Massachusetts, where I used to live, uh, where I'm still a member of the bar, uh, is one of those states. So if you threaten somebody with a gun, don't fire a shot, but threaten someone with a gun in Massachusetts, you have to meet the same legal threshold as you would have to meet if you actually shot them with a gun. Same, same thing. They don't treat them differently. And the, this was a court-made rule. And the reason the courts adopted that rule is they said, listen, if we let people just pull the gun under circumstances where they wouldn't be privileged to actually shoot it, we're kind of encouraging people to pull a gun. Um, and 
create a situation in which it's easier for things to escalate to shots being fired. So we don't want that. You can't pull the gun unless you would have been privileged to use the gun. Other states take the opposite approach, and they clearly distinguish, explicitly distinguish between mere threat and use. And Louisiana is one of those states. They allow for the threat of a gun under circumstances where the actual use of the gun would not be privileged. So you can point the gun at someone, that's lawful, but you can't shoot them because that would be unlawful under the same fact scenario. So they, they have an explicit policy about this, and they explicitly say, Mere threat of force we're going to treat differently, more liberally, than we will the actual use of force. The standard for the actual use of force is going to be higher. And unfortunately, between those two extremes, the large majority of states are irritatingly ambiguous about how they plan, if they plan, to distinguish between a mere threat of force and a use of force. And this law firm press release, and I again, I'll link this in the text version of today's show, they're, they do it in a very confusing and not uh, very rigorously thought out way. Their, their argument's a little, not as coherent as I would like it to be. But the bottom line is what they're arguing for is that a threat of force should be treated than a use of force. And specifically, they're saying, hey, if the use of force, if the firing of the gun would be the basis for a felony charge, against which, of course, you'd have to raise a legal defense then. Let's say the legal defense is self-defense. Yes, I fired the gun, but I did it in self-defense. If the actual firing of the gun would be the basis for a criminal charge, uh, then the mere threat of the gun should only be treated as a misdemeanor offense. You didn't actually fire it. You didn't actually shoot anybody. We should differentiate threat and use by saying, all right, even if use would have been a felony against which you'd have to raise a legal defense, mere threat is only a misdemeanor against which you'd have to raise a legal defense. And the important thing there is the legal defense you have to raise is much easier for a misdemeanor than for a felony. So it'd be much easier to raise a defense against the misdemeanor charge than against the felony charge. Also, of course, the, the criminal liability for a felony charge is enormously greater than for a misdemeanor charge. So if the, if the use or threat of the gun is treated like a felony, you could be looking at 10 or 20 years in prison. If it's only a misdemeanor, you're looking at, by definition, less than a year in prison. So huge difference. So it's a much reduced threat that the prosecutor is holding over your head as leverage to get you to take a plea bargain, right? If, if you know you're facing, at worst, 10 months, well, then you may say, no, I'm going to argue. I'm going to fight this case and take my chances, and worst, I'll do 10 months. Probably not even 10 months on a first defense anyway. Uh, probably no time at all. But if the prosecutor says, uh, hey, listen, we're going to charge you with a crime that's good for 20 years if you get convicted, but we'll give you a plea for no time served, a low-level felony, no time served. You lose your gun rights, you lose your voting rights, you lose all that because you're a convicted felon, but you don't have to worry about spending most of the rest of your life in prison. Well, that's, that's a hard offer to say no to when you think about it and you sit down with your wife and your kids and, you know, uh, most lawyers would tell their clients to seriously, seriously consider that plea offer. Um, but of course, it's only, it only has that power to compel you to accept the felony conviction because of the enormous time you'd spend in prison if you were convicted. A misdemeanor doesn't have that kind of power. No one's going to plea to even a low-level felony if they can take their chances on a mere misdemeanor. So the benefit of this lawyer's approach is, hey, if it's an actual use of force, you can make it a felony charge, and then we have to be able to show that we were facing an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to be justified in that use of our gun. But if, if we only threaten with the gun, if we only point the gun, and we have an arguable claim of self-defense, well, then it's only a misdemeanor charge, and we don't have to show, because it's a non-deadly force scenario now, because it's a misdemeanor, I don't have to show I was in fear of imminent death I have to show I was in fear of any degree of harm, however slight, which obviously is a much lower threshold. So I think really, if you look at this from a public policy decision, there's good arguments to be made. Frankly, I think reasonable people could come down on both sides. I think reasonable people could say, no, we don't want you waving a gun around when you wouldn't be allowed to use it. Uh, like the Massachusetts court said, well, it could escalate the situation to gunfire when it didn't need to go that way. Uh, and keep in mind, folks, it's not just you who gets to wave a gun around if we relax the rules, right? Um, that crazy neighbor down the street gets the same benefit of the relaxed rule that you get. Do you want him to feel freer to be waving a gun around? 
So we have to think about the downsides as well as the upsides of all this. Um, the upside, of course, from a defender's perspective is that it really takes a lot of teeth out of the prosecutor's jaw. And I think a lot of these kind of public policy decisions are often driven, people's preferences are driven by the uh, political and social reality that they happen to be living in at the time. Uh, and to illustrate that, um, we're all familiar, or hopefully we're all familiar, that there, some sentencing laws are uh, within the discretion of the judge. There's a broad range, five to 20 years, and the judge can take into consideration all kinds of mitigating factors and so forth. Sometimes there's strict guidelines that have to be followed, but they can still take into consideration mitigating factors um, to reduce what would otherwise be a higher sentence. And then on the other hand, we have mandatory minimum laws, which say, we don't care what the mitigating factors might be. If you're convicted of this criminal offense, it's five years, mandatory minimum, no possibility of early release, or 10 years, or 15 years, or 20 years. And by the way, if you get hit with multiple counts, you got to serve the sentence consecutively, not concurrently, not parallel, but one after the other. So obviously very, very severe sentences can follow from these mandatory minimum sentences. And today, uh, there's a lot of criticism of mandatory minimum sentences because it takes discretion away from the judge. But I can tell you, as someone who was practicing law when a lot of these sentences, mandatory minimums were first passed, they were passed because of widespread perceptions that judges were too lax in their sentencing of violent criminals, that guys were committing bad violent acts and effectively doing little or no jail time. So the public lost confidence in the judge's use of discretion, and they took that discretion away from them, not for no reason, not for irrational reasons, for per perfectly rational reasons, as they perceived the environment at the time. Now, fast forward 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and maybe we have less of a concern now with violent criminals not serving enough time because, frankly, a lot of them are getting hit with the mandatory minimum, minimums and serving enough time. And because people aren't constantly seeing in the news, oh, this guy committed manslaughter, he was out in two years, they're not seeing those stories because of the mandatory minimums. Well, that risk is less of a concern to them. It's less real to them. So they feel less strongly about the need for mandatory minimums, and they're more uh, open to the counter-argument that mandatory minimums might, in some cases, be too severe a punishment. We had this happen in the state of Florida, for example. They had a, um, they grew very tired of judges releasing gun criminals. Very little time or no time served at all. So they passed what they call their 1020 life statute, which imposed mandatory minimums for crimes committed with guns. Um, and you could uh, you fire a shot, like a warning shot, for example, not pointing the gun at anybody, not hurting anybody. Um, be charged with uh, aggravated assault for putting them in fear of eminent deadly force harm and get a 20-year mandatory minimum sentence. And this, this 1020 life began to be used by prosecutors in cases that looked a lot like self-defense, like a well-intentioned, normally law-abiding citizen got scared of a criminal aggressor, fired a warning shot, and then found himself convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison. So in that case, the mandatory minimum began to be seen as a bit of an overreach. And in fact, the, the Florida legislature removed the criminal offense of aggravated assault from that mandatory minimum scheme. So it's not in there anymore. So prosecutors can't use it in that way. Um, in this particular case, I think what a lot of people are getting tired of is prosecutors uh, being uh, politically motivated, over aggressive in charging cases that look to a lot of us like pretty legitimate cases of self-defense, like the McCloskey case, like the Rittenhouse case, like a lot of the cases that we're seeing in the news these days, where it appears like politically motivated prosecutors are bringing extremely severe, the most severe charges, murder charges, against defenders in circumstances that look a lot like, um, like credible cases of self-defense, knowing, of course, that the prosecutor's doesn't just have to show that maybe it wasn't a credible case of self-defense. They're going to have to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, which they seem very unlikely to be able to do, but they're using the courts as a punishment itself, the process as a punishment. Well, if you make a mere threat of force not qualify as the basis for a felony charge, that would mean the McCloskeys, for example, could not have been charged with felonies. That would mean they're not looking at 10 or 20 years in prison. That means their legal defense is only to show that they had a expectation, a reasonable anticipation of some degree of harm, however slight, which they could almost certainly do. 
So the, that takes away teeth from the prosecutor. Right now, the prosecutor was simply able to charge them with felonies. Uh, now they're facing decades in prison. Now they have to be able to prove they were facing an imminent deadly force threat as part of the legal defense. You can take those teeth away from the prosecutor if you treat threat of force differently than actual use of force. So that's what that press release was about. I just thought I would share that with all of you. Let's see how much time we have. Can I dive into something else? That topic is very long, so I'll skip it. Oh, by the way, so I'm sure all of you know about this, uh, the Jacob Blake shooting. Jacob Blake was the guy who was reaching into his car when he was shot seven times in the back by police. He's now apparently paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, the first news reports about Jacob Blake was that, oh, he was just there uh, to settle an argument between two women in the neighborhood, uh, and the police lost their minds and just decided to shoot this unarmed man seven times. Of course, this almost invariably happens. We learn that Jacob Blake was not a nice guy, was fighting lawful arrest. Uh, the police were exercising a open warrant on him uh, for rape, for trespass, for disorderly conduct, the rape, of course, being the most severe of those charges. And uh, he had, was being subject to forcible arrest because he was not complying. He broke free of the cops, ran around to the driver's side of his car, uh, all the while being at gunpoint by police who were screaming at him not to do any of this, opened up his car door, reached into the car where a knife would later be found, and uh, that's when the police shot him. So near as I can tell about as clean a police shooting as possible. But of course, Jacob Blake now, they have uh, football players are wearing his name on tape on their helmets as in some kind of show of support. Apparently they forgot all about this guy's rape victim. Now, of course, the people who want to push this narrative of Jacob Blake as a, uh, a helpless victim of uh, racist police murder, uh, it's harmful to their narrative that Jacob Blake was had an open warrant for rape that the police were executing on him. Uh, so you can see the counter propaganda begin to come into play. Uh, here's an example of that. I saw a AP news headline uh, just the other day. Let me pull this up. Here's the headline. Uh, Associated Press uh, post claiming that Jacob Blake faces child rape charges are unfounded. Well, anyone who just reads the headline, of course, most people only read the headline would say, oh, wait, these rape charges against him were unfounded? Well, maybe he wasn't such a bad guy after all. People are lying about this poor Jacob Blake. I can't believe they would do that to him. Well, of course, most people don't read past the headline, but here at Law and Self-Defense, we're not most people, so we do read past the headline. And here's what we discover. First, the, uh, the American Associated Press piece uh, notes, uh, while some social media users have sought to call Blake's character into question with false claims about his criminal record, again, suggesting that this rape charge, this rape warrant, well, this is a false claim, right? And intending to uh, impugn Blake's character, to call his character into question. But if you keep reading, here's what you learn about the actual facts here. And that is that Blake was charged, the AP has to concede, with third-degree sexual assault, and had a warrant open on third-degree sexual assault, but it did not involve a minor, according to the criminal complaint. So the AP's argument, in effect then, is, well, you know, come on, uh, Jacob Blake, sure. I mean, he was, uh, he was not a nice guy, but he wasn't guilty of child rape. I mean, I should say charged with child rape. He was only charged with rape rape. So I guess the argument is that, well, if all he did was rape a grown woman, he gets a pass for that, that his victim, when he's at her home again, should not have called the police or when the police show up, they shouldn't execute an open warrant for sexual assault on Blake. They should, what, just let him go? Let him stay there? The police should drive away? Let him continue to terrorize his rape victim? It's amazing how comfortable these propaganda outlets are to say almost anything if they think it advances their political team. What else do we have? Oh, something else I wanted to mention. So I've gotten a, and some of these high profile cases, a lot of money becomes involved, folks. Uh, uh, GoFundMe things and other means to gather together lots of money. Um, and it becomes possible for some of these things to become really a profit generating machine. Um, I want to show you a couple headlines. This is about the Ahmad Arbery case. And apparently Ahmad's mom, uh, his mother has become quite upset 
at what she perceives as organized efforts of other people unassociated with her or her son uh, to raise money off his name. Here's one headline. Ahmad Arbery's mother says some foundation using her son's name without her consent. Uh, she's uh, criticizing people using Arbery's name for nonprofits and trademarks. Um, another headline here, a little more histrionic. Ahmad Arbery's mom, stop cashing in on his death, rips friends, fundraisers. Um, well, I can tell you folks that uh, that certainly can happen. I mean, I don't know if it's happening or not uh, based just on headlines, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, it's not uncommon for an event that's kind of energized the public uh, for, what can I call them, but grifters to go out there and say, hey, give us money. Uh, we're supporting this effort. And then they just keep the money. The point I want to raise here, folks, is that can happen both ways. It doesn't just have to happen with the uh, the other team, if you think that way, it can happen with your team too. So I can tell you I've gotten a number of calls from people purporting to be involved in the Kyle Rittenhouse defense, um, asking me if I'd be on their team and so forth. Um, and frankly, it's not at all clear to me that they're actually part of the Rittenhouse legal team. Uh, and it makes me wonder if it's not really a grift. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars apparently have already been raised for Rittenhouse. I expect that to exceed a million in no time at all. That's a big pot of money that's going to attract, well, grifters. So I'm certainly not suggesting that anyone who wants to should not donate to the Rittenhouse Legal Defense. He's going to need all the resources he can get. So I, if anything, I would encourage that. I'm, I'm all in favor of a robust legal defense for anybody, uh, particularly someone whose case looks as much as lawful self-defense as Kyle Rittenhouse when such a case in particular is facing the kind of uh, politically driven uh, attack narratives that his is facing. I'm only urging you to be cautious about it, folks. Just because someone says they're collecting money for Rittenhouse doesn't mean they are. Uh, so keep your BS meter carefully attuned. All right, so I'll take the last 10 minutes or so answering some questions. We had a couple, I think, short ones I can hit pretty quick. Um, that came in over, here we go. Uh, we had a question from one of our Platinum members asking, does it make sense to buy uh, self-defense insurance, legal service memberships, uh, if you don't carry a firearm? Uh, they do sometimes carry a knife, they say. Uh, well, I'd say two things about that. One is, uh, in terms of the law, the law doesn't care whether you defended yourself with a gun or a knife. It's both deadly force defense. You're going to face uh, the same kind of criminal charges. Uh, the only thing maybe you'd be missing is uh, a lot of states have um, sentencing enhancements or uh, uh, kind of um, enhancements of the underlying crime if it involves a firearm, particularly the gun control type state. So that can be a difference there. But uh, using a knife is not going to save you from a felony charge of aggravated assault or aggravated battery or murder if the person you use the knife against dies. So the, the legal risk you're facing is really much the same for all practical purposes. So if you thought you would need the coverage if you were carrying a gun, just because you're carrying a knife doesn't mean you don't need it. Uh, the legal peril is much the same. The legal costs are going to be much the same. The other thing I would say, however, is I know there are plans out there that might only cover a gun. They might not cover you if you use a knife in personal protection. Now, I don't have time here to step through every one of these plans and every detail of them. I would just encourage you, when you're considering one of these plans, make sure you know whether or not they're going to cover uh, the particular weapon you're using. Frankly, my preference would be that they're, they're weapon independent, that it's just not a factor. The only thing that should matter, to my mind, is whether or not your use of force was, in fact, lawful. And I don't care if it was a gun or a knife or a car or a piano or an anvil from a great height. It, it shouldn't make any difference. But I know some plans are organized around like concealed carry permits. And that's, from their perspective, it's understandable, right? They know if someone has a concealed carry permit, they've at least passed a background check. They're probably not someone who gets into trouble much. So it's kind of a filtering mechanism for them. But just be aware, you know, with any insurance, folks, read the fine print so you make sure you know it's covered. Uh, that's why, although CCW Safe is a sponsor of our show, I'm personally a member of CCW Safe. I don't tell people that that's the plan they should get because I can't possibly know if it's the best fit for you as it is for me. You need to make that determination for yourself. I'll put that up, little CCW Safe slide up while I mention that. Um, 
Okay, another question that came in. I think at this point, given the paucity of time, let me look through this. So I brought up the uh, the threat of force and Texas. And every time I do that, one of our members, uh, I'm looking now at the member dashboard, their questions get priority. Uh, Oscar James always brings to my attention uh, that Texas has a statute that uh, directly touches upon this issue. Uh, the uh, essentially the threat of force as justifiable um, uh, use of defensive force or threat of defensive force, making it different than use. And essentially the language is if the threat was made for purposes, for defensive purposes to dissuade an attacker. Uh, I don't have the statute right in front of me, but that's the general essence of it. The catch with that statute, of course, is that condition. It's lawful. That threat is lawful only if it was done for lawful purposes. Well, <laughs> It becomes kind of a circular argument. Who's to say it was done for lawful purposes? Of course, that's what you're saying. But the guy you threatened isn't going to say that. You're going to say, well, I displayed the gun because he showed me a knife and told me to give him, give him my wallet. Is he going to say that? He's not going to say that. He's going to say this lunatic in a gas station didn't like the color of my car and threatened me with a gun. Well, do the cops know what actually happened? Do the, does the prosecutor know? Does the judge know? Does the jury know? Of course not. So it's nice to have a statute like that, but it's not nearly as decisive as it might appear to be because it leaves open the key question whether or not that display was, in fact, for lawful defensive purposes solely to dissuade an unlawful attack. Um, and if it's an open question, then you, you go to trial just like anybody else would go to trial even without that statute. So... Oh, somebody else asked about that attorney barn. So in that same video, um, podcast video where Barnes, uh, attorney Barnes is being interviewed, uh, he makes very clear that he thinks very little of two of the lead attorneys on the Rittenhouse legal team. One of them is Lynn Wood. Lynn Wood uh, represented Nick Sandman in the civil litigation. Sandman was the uh, young boy, the high school student, who was portrayed by CNN and other outlets as being a racist because he was uh, confronted by some Native American Indian banging a drum. And uh, uh, Lynn Wood uh, represented... Sam and civilly and apparently got some enormous judgment um, for libel slander out of CNN. Now, Linwood is, of course, again, a civil attorney. He's not a criminal defense attorney. Um, he's also brought onto the team, apparently, a guy called Frank Pierce, uh, another attorney. Pierce is a, I want to say, controversial presented as controversial by the media. Uh, there's allegations that his law firm owes people a lot of money that they're not paying. I don't know if any of that's true. Most of what you read in the media is a lie for propaganda purposes. Pierce denies all of it. I don't know if what he's saying is true. Um, clearly, Attorney Barnes has very strongly held opinions about both these guys, Linwood, Frank Pierce, and would never have them on any legal team that he was in charge of. Uh, but I don't have any personal knowledge to assess whether or not that perception by Attorney Barnes is accurate or whether there's anything wrong with Linwood or Frank Pierce that would suggest they shouldn't be on anybody's legal team. I just don't know. I mostly get concerned if I see things not happening that ought to be happening, or I see things happening that ought to not be happening. So my concern isn't really how attorney Barnes is characterizing these two guys uh, personally. That's up to him, and he may know things I don't know. I couldn't say. My concern is when I hear things like, well, uh, Rittenhouse was at his arraignment with only a public defender. That's not good. That shouldn't be happening. Not when hundreds of thousands of dollars have been raised for him. Somebody, not a public defender, who's not, not that there's anything wrong with public defenders, folks. Most, a lot of the best attorneys I've ever worked with have been public defenders. I started in the law in the public defender's office. Um, but public defenders are almost invariably overworked. If you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars for legal defense, you don't want a public defender, not because there's anything wrong with a public defender, but because that public defender can only ever give you 1 20th of their time. You don't want 1 20th of your attorney's time. You want 120% of your attorney's time. So someone should have been there. Um, so when I hear that, and by the way, I don't know if that's true either, but if I hear that, that gets me extremely concerned, much so, much more so than anybody's uh, personal characterization of another lawyer. Lawyers are, uh, it's not uncommon for one lawyer to say bad things about another lawyer. Okay, let's look through the Facebook comments now. Oh, Paul says he got his DVDs in his P.O. box. I'm glad to hear it, Paul. Be sure to let us know what you think. We always like testimonials. If you really enjoy them, uh, tell your friends. And if you, uh, if you don't really enjoy them, you know, silence is golden. But I'm sure you'll like them. 
See, Oscar James says he's sipping coffee from his Law of Self-Defense mug. That would be one of these mugs, folks. They're really quite nice mugs. Law of Self-Defense, hard to kill, hard to convict. Uh, and you can get your own if you'd like. They're at lawselfdefense.com slash mug, if that's of interest. Let's see. Uh, Ski asks, my, when I shared my anecdote about the Zimmerman witness who got impeached on the stand, no, it was no relation to the, the current scandal about uh, uh, whether or not... Uh, what's the, uh, the crazy girl's name who was on the witness stand at the trial? Sometimes they call her Diamond. Sometimes they call her... Uh, she went by different names. But the accusation now, in a, I believe, in a civil suit brought by Zimmerman is that uh, she was not, in fact, the actual witness who should have been testifying, the actual girlfriend of Trayvon Martin. She was a substitute witness, a fake, in effect. Uh, I don't know if any of that's true or not, folks. I, I'm not covering that detail of the trial. But the witness who was impeached at trial had no relationship to any of those people, to my knowledge. Oh, Jack says Walker and Taylor is a law firm behind Texas Law Shield, U.S. Law Shield. If you say so, I wouldn't know about that. I, I've never really heard of them before, but I don't really pay attention to such things. Um, whoever they are, uh, they 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 could have made a more co coherent argument uh, in for the cause they were espousing than they did in that press release. I will say that. Let's see. Uh, so Helen says, uh, well, what about a threat of a mob? Isn't that enough grounds to fire upon someone to protect your home and family? I guess talking about the, um, the McCloskey's, um, the, the legal standard doesn't change. The legal standard is, are you facing an imminent threat of deadly force harm? Now, certainly a mob, even of unarmed can represent a imminent threat of deadly force harm. The sheer disparity of numbers could do that, but merely because a mob is present doesn't mean that they do represent an imminent threat of deadly force harm. There would have to be conduct that would suggest they intend to use their disparity of numbers to cause death or serious bodily injury. So a mere group of people is not enough. Now, the McCloskeys, of course, are saying that, well, they had other evidence of this. They were being threatened. Their lives were being threatened. Their home was being threatened with arson, for example. Um, but whether or not you know, I, I don't hear those threats clearly on the videotapes. It would have been nice if the McCloskeys had their own videotapes where those kinds of threats were clearly audible. Um, by the way, folks, another question that's come in with the Rittenhouse case is the guy who was shot in the arm, this Gage Grosskreutz, uh, because uh, he was shot in the arm and he was approaching uh, Rittenhouse with a pistol in hand, as we can clearly see in the video and still images. Uh, it turns out that Grosskreutz is a convicted felon, so obviously a prohibited person. It's not privileged to have a gun uh, as a convicted felon. It's another felony for a convicted felon to be in possession of a gun. Um, I think every state has that on the books now. When I first started practicing law, believe it or not, uh, Vermont did not have a state law prohibiting felons from being in possession of firearms. I believe they do now. I think they've since adopted it. Um, but in any case, there's a federal law on it. So uh, the question is, well, why hasn't Grosskreutz, who's now walking around his arm, what's left of it, in some kind of cast, uh, why hasn't he been charged as a felon in possession of a firearm? It's a felony. Um, if not at the state level, then why not at the federal level? I mean, we can under, kind of understand at the state level, the state level appears to be so politi politically polarized in favor of the Antifa BLM mobs uh, that they're simply not prosecuting anybody on that team. Um, including gross crudes, but what would keep the federal um, prosecutor from bringing federal charges against gross crudes? And the answer is nothing if he wants to. So the real question is, well, why apparently does he not want to? Because if he wanted to, there'd be nothing to stop him from doing that. Uh, so I don't know what the answer to that question is. You'd have to ask that federal prosecutor. Certainly he has all the evidence he could possibly want uh, to bring the charge and make it stick. Let's see. Yeah, so Joseph uh, says something here in the comments on Facebook that uh, as a point I should perhaps um, spend a moment on before I go. And that is, we talked about the mere threat of force and the use of force. Uh, should merely pointing a gun at someone uh, be permitted, be lawful, or lo lawful at a lower threshold 
um, than would firing the gun? Or alternatively, should you be allowed to point a gun at someone under circumstances in which you would not be privileged to actually shoot them? Um, and most of us have been trained that you don't point a gun at someone unless you are prepared to shoot them. That's different than saying you don't point a gun at someone unless you're going to shoot them. Uh, in the process of presenting the gun, circumstances might change. Uh, you might be being uh, the victim of an armed robbery or somebody armed with a knife. You decide to defend yourself. As you're presenting your gun, they see the gun, they drop the knife. Well, arguably, they're no longer a deadly force threat, and therefore shooting them would not be lawful, even though presentation of the gun was lawful because at the time they still had the knife in their hand. Um, so I wouldn't want people to think that if you've drawn the gun, that means you have to shoot. Um, I think a reasonable argument can be made that it's probably not prudent to draw the gun unless you're prepared to shoot. Uh, but if circumstances change, well, then you should, within reasonable limits, within your human capability, uh, then your defensive response should change appropriately. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone here mentions if you need a lawyer from you need a lawyer from your own state, he can hire professional consultants. Uh, you need a lawyer who's admitted to practice in that state. Now, sometimes the admission uh, process can be uh, rather flexible. Um, so, a lawyer who's got a, a lot of experience, a good reputation in another state, might be admitted by a court to practice in that state for the purpose of that one case that's before the court. Uh, that's not unusual. It happens quite often, especially in high profile cases. Uh, where a lawyer will come in who's not barred in that particular state, but the judge will permit them uh, to act as a lawyer in that one case as if they were a member of the bar. Um, I can tell you my own personal law practice here at Law of Self-Defense, as I'm a member of the bar in Massachusetts, it's the only state I'm a member of a bar, uh, but I work on cases all over the country because I am a legal consultant in those cases. So that client is not my client. That client has a lead counsel, their lead attorney, um, who is licensed to practice in whatever the relevant state is. And then my client is that attorney. And all my legal advice gets filtered through that lead counsel before it gets to the end client, uh, which is why I'm able to consult on cases in any state without having to be a member of that bar. I'm not providing final legal advice to that client. Their lead counsel is doing that. Uh, Ray asks, is that an LFI certificate on the wall behind you? I'm surprised he can tell that, but yes, it is. I have a, a number of my uh, most uh, valued certificates behind me. One is my LFI 1 class from 1996. Uh, another is my uh, certificate from the class I took with Jeff Cooper. Uh, same year, I think, or maybe 95, 97. Uh, a couple uh, uh, humble uh, IDPA certificates when I was uh, actively competing, which unfortunately I don't have much time for anymore. Certificate from uh, one of my talks at the FBI Academy. Basically, it's my I love you wall. So, but yes, LFI certificate for sure. Uh, yes, Masayub is the guy who turned me on to this whole career focusing my practice on use of force law. Uh, and of course, he was kind enough, as many of you know, to, uh, I think I got a copy of the book here, kind enough to write the foreword for the most current um, edition of the Law of Self-Defense Third Person. Uh, many of us in the uh, self-defense community stand on the shoulder of giants like Masa Yu. We couldn't possibly where we are, be where we are today uh, without him having kind of um, plowed the road before us. So many thanks as always to Mas. Uh, John Gammon asks, what about the low ready position? Well, this just gets into, in other words, would that be a use of force, a threat of force? The law is completely ambiguous about it. It doesn't make any clear distinction. So it becomes a matter of discretion for the prosecutor. Um, now, I, I know in most of the country, most of the prosecutors I talk to, they do distinguish between a hand on a holstered gun and a gun at low ready and a muzzle on a person. Uh, they do distinguish between those things, and they're more likely to charge an aggravated assault if you have the muzzle on the person than if you've kept the gun at a low ready or if you just put your hand on the gun in a holster, even in such a way that it's obvious to the other person that you've done that. You've put your hand on the gun. Um, but they're not required to do that. Uh, once you put your hand on the gun, once you've made that other person afraid of an imminent deadly force attack, which is what you're doing when you put your hand on your gun in a way that they know that that's what you're doing, uh, you've checked the boxes for an aggravated assault with a weapons charge. 
Uh, and if they want to treat it like that, well, then you'll have to raise the appropriate legal defense to that criminal charge and incur all the expense involved in defending against that kind of criminal charge. So you know, we all hope that we live in a jurisdiction or an era in which prosecutors will use their discretion prudently. Uh, and in the old days, that was common. Uh, these days, with politically motivated prosecutors, if they perceive you as being on the opposite team, they just throw the book. And the, you know they'll make you burn through a couple hundred thousand dollars in the in the legal process to to get out from underneath those criminal charges, which you may not do. Right? You might end up getting convicted. There's always at least a five or ten percent chance of getting convicted if you go to trial, folks. That's just the noise in the system. I hate to say it, but that's the way it is. So it, it, we'd be living in a much better world if we had more adult, less politically motivated prosecutors. But increasingly, that's not the world we live in. All right, folks, it's been a bit over an hour. I ran long again. My apologies for that. I try to be respectful to your time. Um, as always, I will now, Before just before I go, I do want to mention one last time because this is only, by the time we talk again next Thursday, this opportunity will be over. And that is our uh, Rittenhouse Bundle, a collection of our most popular, most comprehensive self-defense law instruction our Law Self-Defense Advanced Course. Um, this is our full day course. These are all, by the way, provided in, in online streamed format, so you have instant access the moment you sign up. This is our full day course, Law Self-Defense Advanced Course, our advanced state-specific supplement. for We have them for each of the 50 states. Pick whatever state you want. Um, it's the state-specific use of force law, a supplement to the advanced course. Defense of property course focuses on defense of your um your home, your vehicle, your business, your pets, your personal property, um, other people's property, uh, use of security devices, um, very comprehensive coverage of defensive property. Uh, and it, it's specific for all 50 states, folks. So it includes access to the defensive property law of each of the 50 states. So it's state specific, no matter what state you're in. Our most recent course, Defense, lawful defense against rioters, looters, and arsonists covers some of the specific characteristics of defending in those environments. Separately, these four courses cost almost $500, $496. This week only through Sunday, folks, $199. Save $300. And this is inspired, of course, by the Rittenhouse event and all the questions we're getting from people, it's apparent to us, just don't have a really sound education in self-defense law. They may think they do, but they don't. Um, and I can tell by the nature of the questions you're asking. So if you'd like a law school level, but plain English, in-depth education in use of force law so you can understand how these cases actually work, this would be a great opportunity to get that education at enormous savings. I think this is the lowest price we've ever had in a bun bundle of this type. And you can take advantage of this at lawofselfdefense.com slash bundle. All right, folks. I will... I think wrap up before I go, just to remind all of you that if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill, which is certainly why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Uh, well, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so that you're hard to convict. All right, folks, until next time, I'm attorney Andrew Branker for Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.